Yeah, it's great to be back. Um, I know you might look at you know, IBM and be like, what's he doing here? I, um, as Brad said, I've been with the show for a long time. Uh, I spent Before IBM, I spent 15 years with Adobe. And, um, and I've been involved with uh, the show from that aspect. I was looking back through some of my pictures, and I saw one from 2010, um, which I don't think was my first time. But, um, but it was the first documented case I could find. So it's good to be back. And, um, and it's good to uh, talk some more uh, shop. So I'll be talking about beacons today. And I have a lot of different uh, demos that hopefully work, you know, wireless being what it is and, and conference situations being what they are. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I do have a few demos along the way as well. So before we get really into kind of how beacons might be used or could be used or can be used or are being used, let's kind of take a step back and kind of see what they are and how they work. So Bluetooth as a technology started kind of coming on stage in 1998 when the first Bluetooth special interest, uh, special interest group uh, formed. So 1998, uh, it doesn't really pick up steam until about 2002 with Bluetooth 1.2 when it starts getting enough speed at 721 kilobits per second to do audio. And so this is where we all start getting Bluetooth headsets and, and, and Bluetooth connectivity for our phones. And then it continues to kind of roll along. And it's interesting, as it rolls along from 2004, 2007, it's, it's picking up, it goes from 721 kilobits a second to three megabits a second, right? Uh, at, at, uh, at Bluetooth 3.0, it's 24 megabit a second. And then IoT came along, the Internet of Things came along and just flipped that on its head. Because at Bluetooth 4, it's really a low power device designed to be run on a coin cell battery made for simple discovery, the, the, the classic kind of pairing mode, you know, you have to go into the Bluetooth screen and, and, and see your device and then pair that with your device and then you have to like a passcode you have to enter and all that kind of, that all goes away uh, with simple device discovery. And so the Internet of Things, you know, hasn't, is, is yet to kind of really fully realize its potential, but it's certainly having an impact on the way we connect to our devices. And Bluetooth 4 is the emergence of Bluetooth Smart or also called Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth LE or BLE. They, uh, the Bluetooth special interest group tried a number of different directions to get consensus on what it should be called. They tried a number of different marketing efforts to get it to be called that, and none of them really stuck, so everybody kind of calls it something different. Uh, but generally speaking, if you see Bluetooth Smart or Bluetooth Low Energy, you're talking about Bluetooth 4 and higher. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So within the context of Bluetooth 4, there are two different modes that a dev that, that device can run in. And it's, it's an either-or situation. Uh, the first one, probably the most kind of common one that most people will associate with their Bluetooth smart devices is what's called a connected mode. It's also called normal mode in the specification. And the idea here is to be able to have devices um, that have, per the specification, per Bluetooth as how Bluetooth spec is written, how they work, what they advertise, how they advertise it, how, they, uh, how, they, how the data gets interchanged, or is, is it... Is it four bytes or is it eight bytes or how, you know, what data is going back and forth and how it gets called, how it gets identified? It's all written up in the spec. It's very, very verbose. And it talks about everything from medical applications to you know, obviously fitness um, and so on. And so this is, the, uh, this is the way that most of you probably have experienced Bluetooth devices today. Um, I have one here and we're gonna give this a shot. So we, you never really know. Oh, never really know what happens, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. So, I, with Bluetooth Smart, because there's no kind of real pairing, and because everything is called out in the specification, there's no need for me to have a custom SDK to be able to interoperate with the, the device. All I need is what the operating system provides me. In which most cases, most devices will, will provide this. Um, so I, I know this is a, just a blank screen. We're going to try to turn on my Bluetooth device here and see what happens. There we go. So that's my heart rate coming off of this monitor, just using generic Bluetooth. And I don't know, maybe I should try to like run around or something. Let's see. Did we get any higher? Come on. No, not get there. Oh, 95. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, 
Wow. I'm more fit than that. Anyway. So that's the, that's the kind of way that most people are used to experiencing Bluetooth. Now, the, again, I didn't have to pair it with my phone. Uh, the Bluetooth specification calls out how this particular health device should be uh, advertised. I'm going to turn this off here. So that's the connected or normal mode. Uh, that was my demonstration. I'm in shape. Round as a shape. Right. Um, the other way then would be an advertising mode. And this is the beacon mode. So when you have a, a beacon device, when the, when the Bluetooth specification and that device, running on that device is, is not in the connected or normal mode, rather it's in the other device, which would be this advertising state, it's sending off some really basic information, effectively all the time. And they call it beacons because you can think of it like a lighthouse, right? The, the light spins around, oh, there it is, oh, there it is, I'm going in the right direction, right? Or I need to avoid that area or whatever the case may be. Um, a beacon, a Bluetooth device in the beacon or advertising mode is very similar. It's always sending off some basic information about itself. And this is, unlike the connected mode where it's a one-to-one -one relationship, my device to my other device in this case, my smartphone, um, the beacon mode is a mini-to-mini is, is -mini relationship. The phone can actually be a beacon. Uh, most cases, devices are dedicated as beacons and uh, they broadcast three core bits of information. There's a few other pieces of information there, but the core ones are a UUID, which identifies the beacon itself. And you can think of, think of this as like the overall brand. So if I'm going to a Walmart or a Target or whatever, pick your, pick your chain, um, that's, that's gonna be the UUID. All my beacons are gonna have a, a single UUID that matches, they're all gonna be the same, they all represent my brand, Wherever, they wherever they're deployed in the world. And then the second piece of information is called the major identifier. And the major identifier would be something like uh, that specific store in Portland, in this block of Portland perhaps, right? That's a specific store, that specific instance uh, to help kind of narrow it down. And then the last two is the minor, and the minor is what's, what's on that shelf within that store in that overall brand. So the three pieces of information allow you to get pretty distinct about where that beacon is located. Beacons come in lots of different flavors. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna leave here and start, getting, start playing with them, the TI sensor tag is a great one to start with. Um, it's got nine different sensors in it. Uh, it also has a buzzer in it and two different color LEDs. Um, the radio is actually configurable for different types of uh, communication even. It's got a great range, so it's a great little sensor to get start with. Um, it doesn't operate functionally as a beacon, just as a Bluetooth smart device. The middle one there is a light blue bean. It's one of my favorites for kind of prototyping. All the little dots on the bottom of the board there, that's a perf board. You can actually plug other sensors and stuff in there and then program it as though it were an Arduino and then you can use that to talk over Bluetooth. And so this guy can actually act as a standalone Arduino. It can also act as a Bluetooth smart device sharing information from that Arduino, or it can also act as a beacon. So it's a, it's a really robust uh, way to kind of start exploring with it. And then the, uh, the, the third one that I like to play with is the uh, Gimbal Series 10. These things are really small kind of key fob form factors, very uh, durable. Um, and uh, to tiny, they're all, all these guys are really tiny, like inch or so, inch or two. Um, and so it's really tiny, it's just a beacon. That's all it does, just a beacon. So go from the TI sensor tag, which is data, the data and beacon, and then just a beacon. So you have three different options there if you wanna go and, and explore them. You'll notice in the bottom of that Gimbal Series 10 that it's two to three weeks of battery life. Two to three weeks. That's actually really small for most beacon devices. Most beacon devices can last a year or more. So these are really conscious towards their, their power consumption. From an implementation perspective, um, Bluetooth 4, as you saw in the kind of history, has been around now for a little while. Uh, it was originally released in iOS 5. So if you have an iOS 5 audience or above, then you have the uh, capability to use Bluetooth Smart. 
If you're talking about Android 4.3, which is Jelly Bean or higher, you'll find Bluetooth Smart there. Or Windows Phone 8 and the Lumia Black series or on, uh, you'll also find Bluetooth Smart there. So it's a very pervasive uh, piece of technology, um, very well adopted and, uh, and ready to be used, frankly. All right, so another quick demonstration. The world's a stage. This one is Revolution All. So that's kind of my view of you guys without you guys in the seats. Um, that's the Revolution Hall looking out. And I'm going to go ahead and start up a, an application here that's going to look for beacons. It's found one on the left side of the stage. That's this guy. It's one of those gimbal sensors. So he's over there. Okay, now, now I'm on the right side of the stage. Well, see, they seem backwards, don't they? I guess it depends on your perspective, but that's this guy over here. So, we've got right and left. So what's happening here is that the, the device is just looking for beacon advertisements. It sees this beacon advertising it picks that up and it passes it on, in this case, to IBM's Bluemix, which eventually lands itself with a via Watson IoT in the browser to let's, let us see in real time where I'm located. So you can imagine that again at a store or something along those lines as well. Okay? Cool. Got beacons working, got internet working. It's like magic. So you have this thing, this technology is widely pervasive. Very available, most devices have it. It's well documented uh, so that most devices can communicate with it. Uh, and it can actually show you where you are relatively inside of a building. So marketers got a hold of this and did what they would do best. They threw ads at you. This is the way most people have experienced beacons today. When you walk into a store, if they have a beacon installation and you have their app installed, you'll get something like, welcome back, here's an ad, right? So that's kind of how beacons are being used today, which is really, if you, if you kind of stop and think about it, underselling what the technology is capable of. So what I'd like to do is kind of explore with you just a few use cases of where beacons might be useful beyond kind of advertisements. And then, um, and then I'll talk about some of the ways beacons fail if you try to decide to go down the beacon road and want to put beacons into one of your installations or your companies or what have you. I'll talk a little bit about how they fail. So the first off would be a logistics approach. In a logistics approach, uh, one of the, and I'll just call a couple quick examples uh, throughout here, but the, the first one will be in Tokyo Haneda Airport, there's, they have a, a broad beacon installation throughout the airport. And then Japan Airlines, they've issued smartwatches that are beacon capable to their staff. So as their staff walk through the airport, right, the flight attendants get off of uh, the plane and they go to their little secret company hideout, right, where, where customers don't bother them and some things like that. Um, and so you, tracking them down to say, oh, look, you're, we're going to move this flight up or we're going to hold off on this flight or whatever. So how do we contact you? Because you're bouncing around the airport, it's a big place. And, so what they use is those the beacons and the watches to track where the employees are in the airport once they get off the plane. And then they can optimize based on that. They can say, look, we've got these guys over here looking at the schedule for these guys. They're not uh, booked for anything until this time. So we're gonna put them on this flight instead and get this out the door. And then we can reorganize and have these guys over here. So that operational efficiency is gained by understanding where their staff are located. So Japan Airlines is the first one to first isn't the first company to use beacons in, in, in an airport setting. Uh, this is Virgin Atlantic. Uh, Virgin Atlantic was the first one to really kind of put beacons into their club uh, building, their club spaces in airports. And they took it one step further, and they equipped the staff in the club with Google Glass. So not only did they have beacons, they knew when their high end guests came in, but they also could see them. And just imagine the kind of the combination of the two walking around the club being like, oh, Mr. Johnson, da 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 like, like you could see his picture, you see his flights, you know when he's coming up, and you know he's there because the beacon told you he's there, he told, it told you what seat he's at. All right, this, so you, it, it's kind of creepy, really. Um, but, 
but really powerful way to make sure that, that the, co the company gives you, the customer, the best experience. I'm try, always trying to figure out, is he drinking like a martini there, or is that? That's, no, that's his boarding pass, I think. All right, so, um, so another way, logistics, from a logistics perspective, and this is, um, this surfaces itself primarily for you, the consumer, but it's really actually helpful for them, the business. So Starwood implemented what they call the keyless system. And the way the keyless system works, as you can see, is you can use your phone to go into the room. Because the phone senses the beacon that's in the door, it knows that you're there, and it can then verify that you're there. So what happens is the general workflow is here is if you book a room in a Starwood property where this feature is available, you'll get a notification. And the notification will say, do you want to use that feature? And you'll say, yeah, sure. And then you go about your merry way, you start your travel, you get to your business meetings, whatever the case may be, and you'll get another notification the day of when your room is ready. And now, you just walk to the door. You just walk to your room. It tells you in that second notification what your room number is, that it's, so you, hey, go to a room, uh, go to room 429 or whatever, right? So go to your room and walk up to your door, tap, boom, and off you go. No more stopping at the lobby after a long day of flying and working and so on. Just go into your room. So the catch for right now is with them uh, is that it's only good for one phone and one room. So like if you're, if you have multiple guests and you're sharing rooms or things like that, it's a no-go right now. They're working on that, though. Uh, it's not a limitation of the beacon technology, it's a limitation of the systems that they implement. So this is helpful, uh, so this is helpful for us as a consumer, uh, but it's also really helpful for them as a business because at a, at a high level, the way they like to put it is that they get to understand when the um, housekeeping can go into the room and make the bed and clean the room and so on. Whether or not you're coming back in for the day or whether or not you, you've checked out. Uh, when you've checked out, that shows up and the housekeeping now knows. So you know you get another, another random knocks and someone trying to break into your door. It's like, oh, no, come back later, right? Um, so, so that goes away and now they can optimize. What, they're not just going down the hall, is this one ready? Is this one ready? Now they know specifically which ones are ready, can direct their staff to those rooms, clean those rooms and, uh, and be on their way. I think, again, the creepiness factor here is that now they know how long you spend in your room, right? Uh, what time of the day you like to come in and out of your room, things. So again, kind of the creepiness factor is there still as well. So venue analytics. So A-B testing is something we use in, in e-commerce or website design for a while, but now with beacons, it's coming to brick and mortar. So the example here that this is, a not, this is not a beacon example, but this is an example of A-B testing coming out into the brick and mortar environment, is, it, is Birchbox. So Birchbox has primarily got their start as an e-commerce uh, company. Uh, they sell cosmetics and, and associated goods, and um, it's kind of a monthly box kind of subscription deal. And they decided that they would go to a brick and mortar uh, model as well. They would extend what they had to do. So now obviously that when they have their online store, they're tracking you and, t and doing A-B testing to figure out what's the best way to make that store hum. Well, so what they did is when they went to brick and mortar is they took the same testing results and applied it to the store. And I think that's really clever. It's very difficult um, because what that means is that when you go to get, the, the, exa the example that, uh, that, that they call out is when you go to get nail polish, it's all the colors. It's not the colors for this brand and the colors for this brand and the colors for this brand. If you think about how you browse it online, you would say, I want this color, and it would show you all the related colors. So that's how they've actually aligned their store, very similar to the e-commerce experience. So you might have any number of different brands all lined up to present the full rainbow of colors. Now once you're in the store, It'd be great if we could continue that A-B testing, and that's exactly the kind of thing that beacons provide. So this is Carrefour, which is a, grocery, a large grocery chain. I think it's about $20 billion business, so it's pretty sizable. Um, and they have beacons in a lot of their properties. This is their property in France, which is one of their showcases. Um, as a grocery store, they have these beacons installed, and then you have their app, and as you progress through the store, it tracks where you go. The upside here for you as, the, uh, as a consumer is that uh, you, can, you can get pairing notices. So for example, you know, if you linger at the pasta shelf, it can come up and say, hey, by the way, 
this is on you know, this uh, this sauce is on sale, or or, gar or French bread, or whatever the case may be that you want to include with it, right, is on sale. So you might want to pair those, so they can actually start making recommendations that are valuable to you, the consumer. For them, functionally, again, here's the creepiness factor, if you will, that they know everywhere you went in the store. So what they do is then they can start optimizing, right? People linger in this aisle longer than this aisle, and then let's so let's take these products and put them on the end caps and put the not so much, uh, not so visited products in the middle, and so on and so forth. They start to optimize via A-B testing physically with you in the store how to arrange the store to best promote consumption. Um, for them, there was 600% new application users and 400% more time spent in the application. I don't know if anybody would like metrics like that. That is a phenomenal metric to have and, and uh, done just by extending it with uh, their existing channels with beacons. Sure, keep track of my time here. All right, so localization. Um, so this is a tougher demo, we'll see what happens. So uh, this is a subway in New York, and as you can see, there's a screen there that tells you that there's a reason that the subway uh, terminal is not functional or what have you, um, and that's great. There's a kind of a functional problem here, though, is that it's just English. So how, do you, you know, so how do you know if you don't speak English, and by the way, there are a lot of people who don't speak English, especially in New York, um, and of course the rest of the world, but if, so, so if you don't speak English, how do you know? And then once you go underground, it gets even worse. A lot of the signs right, are in a language, maybe two, and so you start to get lost. Um, and so you could really use beacons to say, hey, I know this device and I know it likes this language and so I can do translation of signs as I go about my way, whether it be above ground or below ground. And let's see here. So this one is a bit tougher. Let's see what happens. So I'm gonna connect my phone mostly for the purpose of being able to show it. And then I'll go ahead and start up the application here. So let's see if we can get this going. I'm trying to target a beacon here. So I've got two beacons on the stage here. One, th these are both uh, light blue beam beacons. So the phone comes near the beacon. It sees uh, that it's there. It goes out to Bluemix and actually looks up in a database the textual description for this beacon because it knows those three pieces of information, right? The UUID, the major, and the minor. Looks that up in a database and pulls back the information and displays it on the screen. So subway. So for this beacon, it could be subway service is suspended. And then because Watson does really good at translation and things like that, we can certainly give that a go. Let's see here. There you go. So Beacon's now being able to let us know, because it knows where we're at, we can look it up relative in the database, and then we can pull it back to information and have it translated for us and even spoken. Uh, let's try one more. Let's try one more and see what happens here. So Hurricane Sandy, the station is closed. And these are messages I actually took from the New York signs. So um, let's see here. So there we go. Now you've got localization automated through beacons and knowledgeable about where you're at through beacons. So this kind of leads us to the, the, the we've been kind of dancing around this, this next one here, uh, which is pathfinding. And this is probably the biggest opportunity for beacons um, that a lot of ideas come to you very quickly about this. But the, the idea of using beacons to know where you're at indoors because GPS doesn't work indoors. So there's a misconception that beacons provide um, a distance, they don't provide any kind of distance. They provide what's called a relative signal strength, RSSI. And that signal strength gives, with that, with that information, and if you know on a map where you put that beacon, 
you can then start to triangulate where someone, where they, this signal for this beacon is, is bigger than this signal for this beacon. It's relative, but it lets us now figure out that we're closer to one than the other in this particular room, on this particular part of the room. And so you can really start tracking down where people are as they move through a facility. A lot of, re, a lot of uh, companies are doing this, Lord & Taylor, Rite Aid, Target. So as you go through the store, it can, show you where to go. This is really helpful, for example, if you use a grocery, if you use an app, like a tar if you use the Target app to prepare your groceries, it can streamline them, organize them, enter the, the quickest route through the store, so you can go in, get your items, and get out, saving you time. That's the idea. Of course, the inverse is that they get to know everywhere you go in the store. So there's a bit of a, a creepy trade-off there still as well. Um, the Museum of Metropolitan uh, Art in New York has been experimenting with beacons. This is, uh, I think, one of the, this is a great example of it, of beacons. Not only the, the localization thing I just showed, but also that, that pathfinding is, if I'm looking for a sp to do a, a book report or something along those lines on a specific piece of art, and I know the Met has it, then it would be nice to be able to go to their app and say, hey, take me to this specific place. Show me this piece of art. And then let me, you know, using that, that beacon, because it knows I'm at that piece of art, look up information about it and read it to me and tell me about it play music of the period, whatever the case may be, to really immerse me in that piece of art. So being able to use beacons to find your way around the indoor th uh, indoors uh, of, a, of an art museum. Uh, airports are an obvious way. Atlanta and Miami, at least here in the States, have both deployed beacons throughout their airports. So now you can, actually, you can actually go to their apps and uh, find out what's going on, where, where things are, and where you are in that airport. So if you can get you from your gate to your next gate, and maybe you want to stop for a meal along the way, and maybe you want Chinese, right? So you can very easily see where you're going, how to get there, what, how, to, how to most effectively spend your time in getting from point A to point B. Um, Google has also tried to start really getting into airports. There's a few of them on Google Maps where if you zoom in far enough, you can actually see the stores that are at the uh, places throughout the terminal. Uh, and you know th what they're trying to do is get to the point where they're adding beacons so that you can then again have use Google for that kind of uh, knowledge of where you're going. So imagine just using Google Maps, zooming in far enough and actually seeing where you are specifically, that little blue dot or whatever, showing where you are in the airport. I think a lot of times when we think outside, we think, well, I've got GPS outside, so beacons maybe outside aren't the best use. Turns out though that if if you zoom in far enough. Most GPS isn't going to tell you how to get to the, the panda installation or the gorilla installation or the whatever uh, at a zoo. Th that point, they'll, they'll, they'll get you from your house to the zoo, but once you're at the zoo, you're kind of on your own. And um, so it'd be cool to have beacons, even in an outdoor setting like the San Diego Zoo, and be able to say, I want to see these animals. This is my child's favorite animal. I want to take them and see this animal. And be able to get directions on your phone to walk you to that animal in a big, big, vast zoo like San Diego. So beacons aren't just for inside, they can also be used outside. And then, you know, how, how many times do you, do you go to Home Depot every weekend when you're trying to do a <laughs> DIY job? Right? Wouldn't it be nice to have the beacons show you around the store to know where the things are at? And then to be able to analyze that and say, you know, it looks like you are making a deck addition to the backyard you don't have this in your list. Do you have this? Do you want this? You might, might think about buying this before you leave and have to come back again in 10 minutes. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So these are, you know, beacons are, have all kinds of really possibilities when they start looking at more angles of the data than just one. Uh, the next one, and this is the last example, then I'm gonna kind of sum up real quick about some of the ways that beacons fail us. Uh, is table service. So this is a Ziosk. If you go to like a Chili's or a Red Robin or Olive Garden um, and you have the uh, round shape that I have because of it, um, that, uh, that you might find these devices. These are essentially last gen tablets, Android tablets, deployed into the stores and they're set one on every table so that you can then browse the menu, the theoretically order, which most of them don't have enabled yet, but you can theoretically order um, and then pay your bill all through that kiosk. The idea is that it saves the servers a lot of time in trying to hustle around to all the tables when you can self-serve. Um, and you know, 
the two trips, like, here's your check. Okay, I'll come back. And then, you know, okay, oh, you have your credit card there? Okay, great, now, and then, okay, now, no. here you go, here's your bill. Right? Like, it's a, it's a lot of time to go back and forth when you're trying to manage a lot of tables. And then the, the follow-on is that you at the table can then rate your service, and the management can use that to guide the direction of how they educate those, uh, those staff or change the store policies or whatever the case may be. I thought this was, this, I think this is a really cool idea. The problem that I think Beacons could solve with it is that it's just, it's a tablet, it's a screen. That's really all you need is a screen. Well, guess what? When I go to eat, I take my screen with me. Um, so I think that's really a strange way to go about it. And this is no small deal. Chili's alone has 42,000 of these things deployed, okay? A beacon like this is like five bucks. A tablet like that, not to mention the, the charging it every night, the cleaning it. Just put a beacon under the table, let me bring my phone and show me, and, and then and knows what table I'm at, and we are off to the races. So, that in mind, so this is my restaurant called Burgers and Beer. That's because I didn't want to, uh, I started implementing the whole thing because I actually sat there one afternoon and took pictures of the Ziosk over and all the different screens, all the different possibilities. Um, and uh, I was like, that's gonna take a really long time. And I have a life and a job. So, um, so I didn't do that. So I cut it down to, to two products, burgers and beer. And the idea here is that I'm a consumer. So from, from here, I will use my phone to be able to order food. So I'll start up the burgers and beer app. So let's go ahead and start that up. And uh, I know it, it won't, I, I'm not gonna plug it in and show it because I wanna wander a little bit um, to get this point across. But so this is me as a consumer on my app. The thing you're gonna see on the screen is the point of sale system. Okay, so this is when things get really interesting. So if we got a point of sale system. So if I order something, if I order a burger, it needs to go to the server or to the kitchen. If I order a beer, it needs to go to the bar and to the server, right? So the different places things need to go depending on what it is I order and how to route that most efficiently. So I'm going to uh, come over here to this beacon and I will go ahead and order a burger. So I click on the burger and it shows up. I'm at table 20. That's the beacon. It knows what table it is. It's calling it table 20. Order a burger, order a burger. All right, now I come over to another beacon. So let's say I'm sitting at a different table here. I think actually I have it this one. I've lost track of which beacons are doing it. So now I'm over here. Now I'm sitting at this table here, and now I order a beer. So I'll order one, two, three beers. Now if I come over here and look at the bar menu, so the bartender screen, he's got his three beers, right? So just, uh, so we'll come over here. I'm gonna order some more beers, right? Boom, beer. beer. <laughs> All right, so the beacons let me know where I'm at. It can integrate with other systems and then start really adding a lot of interesting value. $1.23, just anyway. All right, so beacons in the wild, how to close up here, how not to fail at deploying beacons. If you think this is cool, you think it might add value for your business, here are some ways not to screw it up. First off, it's more than a gimmick. I think it's, a lot of companies, I think, they look at mobile as yet another channel that they can sell their stuff. And I don't, that's not necessarily wrong in its own right, but when it comes to beacons especially, if you just look at it as another way to sell your stuff, you're really underselling the technology. So it's important to look at it for the wealth of information that it can provide to your business. Not as another way to sell stuff. Look at it as the value you can derive from understanding more about your customer. I, for lack of a, I tried to think of a different way to put this, but the best way I come up with was actually care that your customer is a human being and not a number, and then think about what the beacon can do for them and you as a business. Without having to be like, oh look, a number walked into our store, buy this, right? Uh, so it's more than just a gimmick. It really needs to be thought of as uh, more. When you go forward, uh, if you put it out there, you have to have testing plans. You can't. It's, uh, I've, had a, I've had a lot of luck here to, today with, with bouncing around beacons and stuff like that, but that's not always the case, especially if you think about, like if I want one in every seat, 
What are the acoustics going to, what are the dynamics of the building going to do? How does it impact things? So you really need to be able to commit to beacons on the whole, test them, analyze them, go forward. The Starwood example, for example, they're keyless. So they had third-party uh, encryption testing, and the, they had third-party people try to, to, try to penetrate uh, their security and, and cause vulnerabilities and get into the doors and things like that. Um, so they, they committed to it. They, they brought in a whole different style. They didn't just say, oh, we're going to put beacons on the doors, and yeah, it'll be great. They, they added a whole other level of commitment to it by bringing in testing and thinking about how it impacts. The Met, for example, in their blog post talks about how human traffic, the people, not human trafficking, but human traffic, um, as, as people move through the museum, it actually impacts the signals. And so what they're finding is that beacons might report that they're closer when they, than they actually are because they're getting bounced off of humans. Fascinating things, you need to test these out. You can't just assume you're gonna deploy beacons once and be done. Um, I guess this is very similar, and I, we're going from green to yellow now, and then we'll get to red, which is like the critical no-nos. Um, so evaluate your infrastructure, the placement, where they are, things like room temperature. If it's outside, the ambient temperature. Uh, all kinds of different things impact how these things work. Your phone, what devices do you use? Uh, what devices do your customers use? Again, use it as not as a channel to, com to sell them more stuff. Use it as a channel to learn more about them. Integrating with existing systems, this is getting close to the red now of problems that, that people fail on. And you know, here's the, you, you saw when I integrate with, the, with, a point of, with a theoretical point of sale system, then we start having greater impact. We're routing messages to the right places. Um, and then we can, of course, we want to be able to run you know, an, analytics on the things that people order, when they order. It's one thing to know that I walked into a store and I stood at shelf A for a while and then decided not to buy. It's another thing to know that I walked into the store, stood at shelf A for a while, after tweeting this, because it was raining, because right, when you start putting all those different systems together and pulling that data, you start, you start to analyze it, you really end up knowing and understanding your customer a lot better. So don't forget to integrate with existing systems. Again, not a gimmicky kind of thing. Don't just throw it into, the, into your app and say, yeah, we've got beacons, it's cool, watch what happens. All right. Two last ones, the red ones, have a contingency plan. People turn Bluetooth off. It happens. Um, I think this is really interesting from the Starwood perspective, the keyless entry. If I go to a meeting and I break my phone, I'm not getting into my room. Now they've thought about this and they have plans in place that you can go to the front desk and obviously get a regular key and, uh, and work through that way. But they thought about it, that's the point. You can't just to say, uh, you can't just throw it out there. You have to, have to think about what happens if Bluetooth isn't on, if they lost their phone. And there are other ways to do it. For example, Wi-Fi, some of the more modern Wi-Fi routers can actually help give you location as well. So maybe you tap into your, your building Wi-Fi. Um, but this is a big one that people mess up on. And then the biggest one that people mess up on for when they deploy beacons is that they don't have a real benefit. Um, walking into a store and getting an advertisement for a pair of shoes that I bought online yesterday for more than you're offering me in the store, <laughs> right? That's not a good situation. Again, you need to integrate those multiple systems. Provide, don't, don't just throw me advertisement, provide me a benefit. When I'm going through the Home Depot, like I mentioned, say, hey, look, you have these things on your list. It looks like you might be building this. Here's the other things you might want to consider and help me out so I don't have to make 10 trips to Home Depot while I'm trying to build my dang deck. All right, so, so provide real benefit. Don't look at it just as a gimmick. So that's an overview of different types of beacons, how they work, I've seen some demos of them in action. Um, again, there's the connected state, the, uh, the advertising state. The advertising state is what a lot of people are deploying into their stores. Lots of different ways to go about it, lots of value to be gained from it. Don't screw it up, all right, thanks.